Allora, vediamo se eh, riuscite a sentire meglio la mia voce. Ho cambiato microfono. Eh, in meglio in questo momento. Arriva meglio la voce, più chiara, meno, eh, meno divisa, meno... Pierre? Fateci un segno che vi guardiamo, eh? Insomma, un po' meglio. <ride> un po' meglio. Un po' meglio anche Rita, sì. Quindi, per ora ho cambiato soltanto microfono. Ho cambiato soltanto postazione. <ride> Magari era, que era questo il problema. <ride> ok, dai. Let me just, uh, before starting officially the, uh, the webinar, let me check with all the panelists and the moderator if everything is okay. So just some technical information uh, for the panelists. You, uh, you are co-host of the meeting. That means that you can share directly your presentations. For Anan, Uh, from uh, Aleppo, uh, we will show the video and uh, uh, meanwhile you can speak and you can do your, uh, your intervention as we did agree yesterday. It is okay, okay. for you, Anan? Perfect. Okay. Uh, we quickly test uh, all your voice. I will call you just to test your voice. So we start by Rita. Rita, good afternoon, first of all. Good afternoon, Moira. How are you? Fine, thank you. I think that for you, it's okay. Interpreters, okay? You can hear well the voice of Rita. Rita will be the moderator huh? of, the, of this meeting. Fine. Anan from Syria. Yeah, I'm ready. Could you please uh, tell us a few words in order that we can check? your uh, sound. Uh, I'm Hanan from Carita Syria in Aleppo. I think Aleppo is known uh, during the war. Okay. It's okay. Interpreters? Okay. Fine. Good. Then uh, uh, we have Maria. Maria from Caritas Elas. Not yet in. Maria? Okay, not yet. I will continue. Helen, good afternoon, Helen. Good afternoon, Maria. Would you please speak a bit just to check the sound? Good afternoon, Maria. I'm Chiankari uh, Helen from Caritas, Uganda. I'm speaking from Kampala, very cool at this moment. Good. Fine, Helen, thank you very much. Cristina. Cristina. Hola, buenos Hola. días, acá en Latinoamérica. Eh, les saluda desde Quito, Ecuador. Muy bien, muchas gracias, Cristina. Uh, We have uh, Caritas Philippines, Carit NASA, Caritas Philippines. Hello, good evening, uh, good day, good morning, um, everyone from Caritas Philippines. Very, very good. I think that we are all okay. All the panelists are co-hosts of, uh, of this meeting. So I think that we are 2.30 and uh, I hope we can start. I just uh, would like to receive uh, the green light from the technicians. Okay, good, after good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm happy to see 
again uh, all of you here uh, after uh, 10 days from the first uh, from the first webinar on this important initiative of Caritas Internationalis about women and COVID-19 challenges uh, and aspiration from the Caritas experience. A moment to reflect, uh, uh, to reflect together on the role of women uh, in the COVID context and post-COVID uh, context. Today, I'm delighted uh, to give the floor to Rita Hayam of Caritas Lebanon, who will facilitate this session. Rita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Moira. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So today's theme for this webinar is Women on the Frontline. We have five speakers from five regions. They will share their experience, sometimes based on their personal experience. They will discuss the challenges they are facing, and they will reflect on future steps and questions in order to have a more equitable future and more women in leadership positions. Without further ado, I will leave the floor to our first panelist, Hanan Bali from Caritas Syria. This week marks 10 years of war in Syria, and we are really eager to listen to your testimony. Hanan, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I am uh, I'm very uh, thankful for giving me this opportunity to share my experience today. Um, as you know, the war in Syria uh, it's been uh, 10 years till now, and we are in the 11th year. Uh, the situation now is more worse than before. Um, uh, the insecure, food insecure family are now uh, more than... Uh... Oh, you share my screen, okay. Uh, so let's start with uh, how uh, COVID-19 affect Aleppo. Uh, to be honest, uh, there is uh, only one curfew uh, in uh, last year, in March 2020, uh, but uh, it led to uh, more and uh, more uh, poorest, in, uh, especially in, uh, between the vulnerable people. But the government stopped the curfew, uh, but uh, the big effect, it's uh, affected uh, uh, the elderly, more the uh, youth, and uh, every, everyone else. Uh, the number of days between elderly uh, uh, still, till now, highest than before. And uh, nothing uh, else because this, uh, the economic situation, uh, it's all uh, already affected by the uh, increasing in uh, the uh, dollar between uh, in uh, compare of senior pounds, uh, everything now it's very very uh, expensive, and uh, the woman. Uh, let's uh, speak about the role of women during uh, the COVID. Um, let's start with my experience. Uh, in uh, August, last August, twenty twenty. Uh, I was so aware of uh, the disease and I want to protect uh, I wanted to protect my family. Um, I share uh, the, uh, the uh, awareness due the uh, all my neighborhood uh, between uh, Carita Syria members and also uh, I had uh, like, um, many groups of women from Eastern part of Aleppo. Uh, they were uh, so satisfied and I was so surprised how they deal and how they address this uh, disease. Yani, as you know, uh, the neighborhood in the Eastern part of Aleppo suffered from everything, fr suffered from the first thing is water. So how can they fight the disease without water? It was so hard for them, but uh, uh, the big challenge was the educated woman, uh, yani, and the not educated woman. The woman in Aleppo or in Syria at all divided in two category. Uh, the, the big, the general or the, um, 
the biggest number of women are illiterate, unfortunately. Yani after 10 years of war, uh, especially the youth, they uh, are uh, um, not have the, the opportunity to have uh, education. Uh, so I think if you are thinking to start with uh, something to encourage women, to empowering women, we need to think once or twice and more than one time of education. We need to educate all women in Aleppo or in Syria at all. Because of the war, the women are depriving from the education. So we need to raise this call for let uh, the women in Syria have their education. I think that it's important things. Uh, what uh, can I say for, for women, for the educated women also, they need to encourage them to uh, have their role in uh, the civil, uh, civil, civil role in the government. The woman in Syria still uh, has a lot of uh, challenges, how to, uh, how to uh, express their, themselves because uh, many, many challenges. The first one, it's uh, the very, very uh, worst economic now. Um, yani, if you say, if we, we can say, uh, based on WFP, before the war, only uh, 1 million of point four uh, people are uh, food insecure now, in, uh, based on WFP still, 12 million point four people in Syria suffered for increasing their opportunity to feed their children. Uh, so uh, the COVID-19, yani, it's not so, so big uh, affect uh, Syria because yani, if we speak, uh, especially on women, um, the woman who faced the days and uh, uh, the, the, the some way, uh, displacement more than one time. Uh, they faced a lot of fear and now they faced cold. Uh, the disease and the COVID-19, it's not uh, a big challenge for it, for her. So um, we need to be aware of the importance of education for Syrian women because they have like a gap for 10 years, uh, a generation, a complete generation, uh, now without education. Um, at the end, I very, very thanks for, for having me and for listening to me. And uh, thank you again. And if you have any question, I'm ready. Thank you, Hanan, for your presentation. And thank you for giving us an overview about the situation in Syria, the impact of war on education, on hunger, especially the impact of war on women who had to face uh, displacement many times. Thank you for as well highlighting the fact that um, although women are facing and are living in a very hard context, uh, but they are uh, responding to the disease, although they uh, don't have access to water, they don't have access probably to hygiene as well, which is a, a basic element for uh, fighting COVID. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, I guess this is as well a tribute to all the humanitarian workers and Caritas team in Syria. Thank you, Hanan. Um, thank you. We will move to Greece to uh, Maria Canelopoulou from a uh, project manager from Caritas Hellas. Um, Maria will be focusing on the response to the migrants emergency in Greece. Before giving the floor to Maria, I invite you to share your questions, your comments in the, uh, in the chat. The communication team at Caritas Internationalis will definitely connect, collect all the questions and we will open the floor to two or three questions after Maria, uh, Maria's intervention. Maria, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. It's a great opportunity to see all our friends, all our friends from Caritas uh, Internationalis. I feel very humble to talk after Hanan and uh, all the frontliners at uh, Syria. Uh, we face our own, let's just say, long-term uh, crisis in Greece in a different, of course, uh, uh, context. Um, let me share my screen so I can, can start. Um, uh, presenting uh, the few slides I have prepared for the occasion. Just give me a moment, please. Um, okay. I hope you are able now to, to see my, my screen. So, um, so what uh, we are facing uh, in Greece, we face basically a triple crisis currently. We have uh, the aftermath of a very long financial crisis that hit uh, Europe and, of course, the European South, uh, most importantly, since 2018. Uh, for the colleagues from other difficult uh, fields, maybe this is uh, a bit luxurious, but still for the European, uh, European South, it has been quite a change in people's lives. There have been immense cuts in the welfare state, in the pensions of the elderly, and also a great rise of unemployment and a general deregulation in the labor uh, force. Uh, at the same time, since 2015-16, we face uh, Greece as a main gateway to Europe and also under the Dublin uh, treaties, uh, Greece being one of the host countries uh, for refugees from uh, Syria and from um, other places where there is conflict in the world. And uh, we have been experiencing a prolonged uh, state and actors response uh, to this refugee crisis. And Caritas Hellas uh, during this time has also flourished uh, through its programming, trying to, to help mainly the people in the refugee crisis, but also um, other different types of crisis, financial crisis for the socially excluded uh, Greeks and also disaster response. Um, now we are also faced since uh, also we have our birthday this uh, week, uh, one year ago, the first uh, um, cases of the COVID-19 uh, hitting uh, our country. So um, since uh, a year now, we have also been entangled uh, with the COVID-19 uh, situation. Um, Greece mainly, uh, did, as, a, as a European country, had a different kind of uh, challenges related to COVID-19. Shortages of uh, hygiene uh, was a, a common thing for every country, even in the developed world. We, know, we all know that. Uh, in the first phase, things went quite well because people really you know, were very um, aware of the situation and tried to uh, to follow the lockdown rules and everything that uh, was put in place by the government. But after the summer, uh, in this second phase of the lockdown from November until now, it has been uh, an increase of uh, deaths uh, and uh, really a struggle with the healthcare system, which came, which came uh, also to a very difficult point, almost of breakdown, especially in these last uh, few uh, weeks. Can somebody um, uh, uh, confirm in the chat that you can see the, the, the slides? Because I'm worried I can see only my face. So. <laughs> okay. So um, now, of course, COVID-19 programming with Caritas Hellas has been uh, a double, let's just say, situation. Uh, given the limitation of the funds to the CRF, which so, you know, for our friends from the uh, Caritas Internationalis uh, were kind enough to include us in this uh, initiative. Um, we also did a lot of adaptation in our own, uh, in our current programming, refugee programming, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. 
Uh, so basically, we had only one project, which was, let's just say, COVID-related, uh, uh, only COVID-related, and we decided to do it a targeted uh, approach for single-parent families, uh, since uh, we highlighted, given also the availability and the, the amount of the fund, that uh, it would be better to um, to include these people who have been somehow, let's just say, less cared for from the state actors and the other uh, responses on the field uh, as uh, the most vulnerable, let's just say, cases of people who were left uh, not uh, so much supported. Um, so what is, uh, has, has happened is we, we had a very wide call, open call for all the Athens area and the Athens center area. And we coordinated with our colleagues from other organizations, from for public services to find, to try to find as much as possible the single parent families that have been affected economically, financially, they have lost income during this uh, area, this uh, time. Um, we did a screening of the applications, a very transparent process, uh, learning from the past, also building on other experiences of uh, our network, but also from Caritas Ellis network uh, on programming. And uh, we managed to also have interviews with all the applicants um, and a very transparent process. Therefore, from the 266 applications that we had, uh, we managed to finance uh, the people who were actually compliant with uh, the call, which was 255. And um, for us, it is a great um, uh, sense of achievement that there were no complaints or no appeals. I mean, the process was so clear to all the participants that uh, we managed to, despite the short uh, time of the implementation period from the 1st of July to the end of uh, September, we managed to conclude uh, everything uh, in a transparent and uh, accountable manner. Um, apart from the financial assistance, which was ad hoc once, um, we also had the, the possibility to take the history of each family from our social workers team and manage to also do um, a kind of quick assessment of their needs and the 209 families had also the possibility to be connected to psychosocial services of other uh, more let's just say permanent programming either from other organizations or mainly from public services. Uh, this was, let's just say, our targeted approach to the COVID-19 uh, situation, given also, as I said, the, the amount uh, we had uh, in our um, uh, disposition. And uh, then uh, I will talk a little bit about the adaptation that we did to our refugee programming. Uh, starting from the urban center, uh, it is very important to understand that migrants were at a loss at that point. Uh, there was no provision from the government to have, uh, let's just say, enough uh, documentation or information on their own languages. So Caritas Elas uh, almost um, single-handedly a lot of uh, you know, transformation of uh, messaging uh, to Farsi, uh, uh, Arabic, and other languages of uh, of our uh, of the people that we serve, and uh, therefore we had the possibility to do a, a quite targeted match messaging all, to all the people in different areas. Uh, the one area was the protection and hygiene, of course, which was very important, but also uh, in relation to the governmental measures, because as soon as the lockdowns and limitations of circulation were put in place, uh, we had to make sure that people don't get fined, don't, get, uh, to, don't have to pay the, the fine, which was uh, in the beginning 150 euros, a very big amount for any refugee or migrant. And in the end, uh, it, uh, now nowadays it has uh, doubled even, it's 300 euros. This is a very big amount for any, big, uh, for any Greek family, let alone for somebody who is a refugee. And um, therefore uh, we try to, let's just say, to protect uh, these families from understanding what is, the, what is in the general public, what is happening in the, in the country, where they can, uh, how they can uh, circulate and what the permit of circulation means and you know, create templates for them in their own languages. 
Uh, one other important uh, gap, let's just say, from the part of the state was the information on operation hours and remote servicing of the public sector, uh, because um, all our uh, refugees here are entitled to the services, but it's very difficult to uh, have access to them unless we facilitate, let's just say, this access uh, through the language barrier or other uh, means of uh, um, other uh, obstacles that they face. Um, then we had the, um, uh, and, uh, and another important service we provided in the urban center was a facilitation to access of any kind of state benefits. For example, there has been uh, a benefit for the long-term unemployed. If a refugee or a migrant was a long-term unemployed and could have access to this uh, uh, benefit we try to facilitate for our social services his application. Uh, also, in uh, in this uh, lockdown period, a lot of uh, sectors of the economy stopped working completely, and in these cases, where the halt of uh, the employment was imposed by the government, there has been again a benefit for this uh, uh, for these families. Uh, so, for example, if somebody worked in hospitality in the restaurant, he was a cook. He was a migrant, maybe he couldn't understand that he was entitled to this benefit, and uh, we facilitated uh, this, um, this access. Uh, I think you all will be very uh, curious to, to hear what has happened in the front line of the islands, in Lesbos and Hios, where we work. So there it was a very difficult period, because as you know, also Moria camp was burned down in the beginning of the, of the lockdown. It was a very, very, very tricky situation, hygienically, humanitarianly, in every kind of aspect. Unfortunately, my colleague who has worked on this project is uh, not with us today, but uh, she, she gave me a lot of feedback to, to share with you. So basically what uh, we did is in the context of our psychosocial uh, interventions there, it was very important to have uh, to accompany people to understand what is happening, what is happening with Moria, where they are going to live, uh, what is happening with COVID. It was a very, very tense and difficult situation for any any refugee in Lesbos at that period. Um, we had, uh, of course, uh, dedicated info sessions. Again, very difficult to organize in an open space uh, in. Uh, keeping the social distancing and all the necessary rules and uh, also protecting staff and the participants with uh, masks, which were at the moment then very difficult uh, to, to have at, uh, at that point. Also from not, you couldn't purchase them, you couldn't find them in the, in the providers. Um, so, um, again, uh, one, uh, as things were moving forth, we also provided interpretations at the local uh, primary health clinic and also at the camp in collaboration with the Saint Um We also had a psychologist where people could, uh, you know, find some kind of, let's just say, first aid of uh, psychological um, uh, aspect. And, uh, uh, to put uh, to stress a little bit the women's let's just say uh, programming uh, in the context of a collaboration that we have with uh, UNICEF for a targeted program of women and girls, we had uh, let's just say uh, intensive hygiene messaging for for this uh, particular group of uh, beneficiaries. Um, important uh, little detail is that uh, we open up this uh, service with the psychological support also to the host community. It was important as part of our always effort to, you know, to really include the host community in, uh, in the programming that we do in the islands. In HIUS, it was more or less uh, something um, similar, interpretation services at the hospital, uh, COVID-19 info sessions, uh, hygiene uh, promotion again at the, at the camp, and uh, some basic distributions of antiseptics, masks, and things of the kind. Um, psychiatric support, because we have been doing that for a long time in HIUS, and also in this context, I think it is relevant as well. And uh, our transportation to the HIUS hospital, because the camp and hospital are very far away, and uh, we, we sometimes uh, um, have the possibility to 
carry their uh, patients, which are not though uh, in need of an ambulance because the island has only one ambulance and this facilitates the back and forth to the hospital for people who are uh, um, who have this uh, need. Uh, if I am to sum up a few conclusions from these experiences, I'd say that, uh, of course, as in every country, I think this, we haven't really surpassed that stage yet. Uh, women have a key role in the hygiene, uh, as a hygiene ambassador, let's just say, of the, of the household. Um, in my own thinking, I think that women from all cultures are a force of change, it's a force of change in this uh, particular crisis. Um, and uh, in general, I think uh, women should uh, really be listened to more, uh, especially in the cases where they are able to, to voice, let's just say, this different approach uh, that we seldom, uh, we usually uh, are able to convey. Um, if I am to, to, to make a few points on the deepening of inequalities, I'd say that uh, during this different uh, uh, time, we've seen um, uh, different, let's just say, we have seen the, the excluded people being overlooked in a way, as it is usually during the crisis. Uh, from the one point we had the lockdowns, but we had the quarantines in camps. Quarantines uh, meaning that people could not get out of the camp, which are supposed to be open, uh, so open uh, uh, accommodation schemes for the refugees. So this was a, a very alarming kind of uh, management for the situation. Um, we have seen also um, the precarious workers uh, not being in reality helped by the state because you had this access to the benefits only if you were a registered worker. So this left again the precarious workers at a very difficult position. Single parent families again with closed schools, uh, it has been very difficult to have access to temporary informal employment or even formal employment. Um, we have seen, let's just say, the digital gap being more and more important because uh, when you don't have the basic digital skills, you have limited access to employment, but also to public services since uh, remote servicing became the rule in this area. And uh, if I'd say a new kind of vulnerability which emerged from the situation as particular sectors of the economy, like the art workers, for example, in Greece, which were always a little bit, you know, apart from the big and famous, so the rest are uh, already in a precarious situation. Uh, the hospitality workers, due to the big dependence of the country in tourism, which was uh, closed for a very long period. And also in agriculture, because uh, tourism and agriculture go a little bit together. A lot of these productions are um, consumed uh, in, by the tourists. So no tourists, no no selling of, uh, let's say, cucumbers or uh, watermelons. So this uh, created a lot of problems also in the agriculture uh, uh, workers where there was no benefit or any kind of provision from the state since they weren't really affected from uh, in terms of, you know, not being able to cultivate or something, their, uh, their uh, um, production. So from our experience, I'd say some of very few lessons learned is uh, um, how equitable programming can sometimes be perceived as targeted programming or adaptive programming in the case that you don't have, let's say, more funds. Uh, this is the, our example of how we try to, to respond. Um, you know, the role of the woman really being, again, very complicated and very difficult for the young women who also have children, you know, women, a woman teleworking, children, e-education at the same time in the same house, e-shopping for everything, you know, this created a lot of stress, a lot of added, let's say, responsibilities to a household. Again, you spend more time with your family. Uh, the truth is always somewhere in the middle, but uh, uh, gen in general, let's just say there's been a lot of uh, discussion about how this um, crisis uh, affects the woman uh, in as a, the, the, as a member of her family and how and her duties and responsibilities. And uh, a more general note, not only for women but for everybody. Um, I mean in all, all, all over Europe, but I think all over the world, we have really 
uh, had a, a lot of difficult questions to answer with regard to what does it mean to have access to healthcare? What does it mean to have access to education? What freedom of movement, movement means? And what is our personal data, sensitive data, um, the data that we have uh, from our medical records? Everything is on the plate. Um, in this equilibrium between freedom and uh, safety. And uh, these are the big questions of tomorrow. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you today. And I hope it you found our uh, programming uh, interesting. Thank you a lot, Maria. Thank you for uh, for raising uh, interesting uh, points and questions. So uh, it's uh, it's really important to see uh, you have tackled many important points. Uh, first of all is how you adapted your program uh, due to the limitation of funds. So you targeted more single parent uh, families affected financially. The second and most important point is because you are frontliners, so you were able to detect what are the barriers preventing refugees from accessing the services, and it was language, so interpretation was there. You have been working on interpreting everything related to protection, hygiene, government measures uh, to access COVID-related benefits. Uh, it's really interesting as well how you targeted your, uh, your work towards women and girls, especially for hygiene measures. And uh, I think I'm gonna end up by uh, by uh, by using the terminology "women ambassador" for the households. This is really interesting, and by your call to revisit human rights. Uh, thank you, really, Maria. I, I as as there's no uh, questions uh, asked by the uh, participants, I guess we can move to our third panelist. Moving to uh, Uganda, uh, we have Helen uh, with us, Helen Shanikari uh, from Caritas Uganda. Uh, Helen will be uh, talking about the impact of COVID on the communities and the role of women. A kind reminder to uh, ask all your questions, to reflect, uh, to have all your, com uh, placing all your uh, comments in the chat box. And uh, I will leave the floor to Helen. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Caritas Internationalist team, for giving us this opportunity to present the experience from, from Uganda. Uh, good afternoon, good uh, morning, good evening to everyone who is on this forum today. As of the 16th of March, 2021, Uganda registered 40,568 cases of COVID-19. Active cases are 25,139. Paris with made 15,095. And then Uganda recorded 33. Uh, deaths. Focusing on our theme today, women on the front line, like any other crisis, be it man-made or natural disaster, their impact has never been gender neutral. So is the impact of COVID-19 to both Ugandan and refugees. Uganda is a host of 1,400,000 refugees, mainly from South Sudan, and Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, I came and talked about a little bit of women's role in the fight against COVID-19. On the onset of the pandemic, government set in place a national, regional, and district task force for prevention, mitigation, and response of COVID-19. The national task force was headed by the Minister of Health who is a woman. However, the presentation, representation was very low at regional and district level. For example, in one of our districts, only 8% on, uh, on the task force for prevention is female, while the rest are male. We also noted that 80% uh, of frontline health workers all first responders to those affected 
or expected to be infected by COVID-19 are also women. Women have play also played a great part as caregivers, that is at local level, ensuring that the preventive measures are adhered to at family and community level. The main preventive measures to COVID-19 was hand washing in Uganda. And it is well known that uh, it is a female role. Female, that means the women and the girls to fetch water for the family use. Among the refugees, over 80% women are breadwinners for their families. And when it comes to agriculture, which is the backbone of Uganda's economy, 95% of women are subsistence, are subsistence farmer, meaning farming for food for their, for their families, while their male counterparts tend to engage in cash, cash crops or crops for income generation. During COVID, that means the woman was at the forefront of ensuring that her family had food on the table. The challenges, some of the challenges that the women faced as they were trying to be at the forefront to ensure that all ends meet. That the majority, as we said above there, the 80% who are at the front line were women and these alone exposed them to great risk of infection to the viruses. And during that time, there was lockdown. That means those who were at the front line did not have opportunity to come home to be with their families, giving that gap between their families and themselves. Then we have increased women and girls care burden. Already up, we said that the woman's role, the role for making sure that there is water at home is that of a woman and a girl. High demand for water that accompanies COVID-19 hand washing precautions mean, meant that, and is still meaning that the woman and the girl have to spend more time on water collection. And in other areas of the country, this, the, there is now a lack of water due to the long dry spell. So these women have to walk long distances in order to look for water. Among the refugees, access to food is and was the major and distressing concern. Food ratios were reduced by 30%, while cash, cash was reduced from $9 to $6 per month. And yet, due to the lockdown, travel, uh, these women could not travel freely to different uh, host communities to find alternative sources of food. Inaccessibility of GBV services for survivors or inaccessibility of uh, GBV reporting channels during this corona pand pandemic. This led to increase. Actually, it's reported that the rate uh, doubled. Increase in abuses and also abuses of children and uh, domestic violence with all its psychosocial trauma that it comes with. We had limited access to medical care for pregnant women and also nutritional challenges for lactating women was also experienced during this time. Uh, the women also experience limits, limited borrowing. We all know that 84% uh, of women borrowing in Uganda is through village savings and lending association because they lack collateral or securities to attain bank credits. So most of them borrow through the village savings and lending. And the COVID restriction put, um, put a stop to activities of village savings and lending. Very few could save and very few could also borrow. 
So what's happened? Most women have used up their savings. And the question here is where do they start from in this era now that we are looking at uh, recovery from the, 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 the strong effect of the COVID-19? Uh, what, what was our effort? Caritas Uganda was one of the organizations given permit to work during COVID-19 lockdown. This gave us an opportunity to analyze community issues and respond immediately within our means. Some of our responses that pulled women to the forefront were advocacy for effective women representation and other marginalized groups, for example, the PWDs on the districts and the regional task force. As much as the lead, I said up there that the national task force was led by a woman, this was not the same at the lower levels. At regional district and community levels, women were left behind. Caritas engaged district leadership to ensure women representation, to voice some of the issues that were overlooked. One such issue was on the village water points. In Uganda, one water point serves approximately 300 people. These water points were not thought about initially during planning for prevention. This meant that on a daily basis, 300 people would be exposed to infection per one water point. And already we know that those who go to these water points are mainly women and girls. And it is through the analysis that some of this issue came out. Caritas responded by ensuring that over 500 water points were equipped with preventive measures. That is the hand washing facilities with soap and establishing a committee that was able to monitor and ensure that these hand washing facilities were in place throughout this time of COVID-19. We had distribution of hand washing facilities and strengthening home hygiene and sanitation. Women took lead in ensuring that their families adhere to the standard operation procedures set by the Ministry of Health. They also took the initiative to ensure that their communities also adhered to the same. Women committees were set at that level to ensure that there was water at every other village gathering with social distancing as set in the standard operation procedures. We also did the strengthening uh, and safeguarding for the welfare of children and women. An open line was given in 11 parishes to be reached all through and every time of the day with issues relating to child abuse or domestic violence. We also had uh, radio talk shows on different radios and in different languages within the country, uh, mainly uh, at district and community level. We engaged the, district, the, the, the village health teams, the village health workers to pass on information using megaphones rather than looking at only the, the government information that was being passed on radios or TVs. We introduced the community approach of using megaphones. And out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the, the health, village health teams used, we had 64% female. That means they were on the front line to ensure that this information reaches the people on the ground. Uh, what is the lesson? What, what were the lessons we learned here? 
one main lesson that we learned in this uh, in this um, intervention is that failure failure to involve women at all levels, especially at community, means taken decision will not be able to address urgent and pressing needs that women typically face. For example, the safeguarding of the village water points, a uh, total lockdown without provision for pregnant women to reach the hospital for antenatal care and all any other diseases that would crop in, and many other factors that affected the women during the lockdown. And then in our conclusion, I would say, as Caritas, we need to conduct regular gender analysis to ensure new information becomes available. For Caritas Uganda, it was a big lesson learned. It was an eye opener when we realized that the water points were not planned for. This analysis will help us to keep relevant to the urgent needs of women and girls. Secondly, purposeful and deliberate and deliberate advocacy. All sponsorship of women to get involved in decision making for mitigation, response, and recovery from crisis or emergencies at all levels. This could be through advocacy at national level or at local level. Caritas Uganda, this also we get from Caritas Uganda, when we realized that there, was, uh, there were less women representation at district level, we offered to sponsor and the district op opened up to bring on board uh, two women representatives. And this was done in three districts only, while the rest of the district women representative remained low. So we say that if we can have purposeful and deliberate action to ensure that women are involved in these decision-making uh, forums, or task forces for mitigation, re response, and recovery from the coronavirus, COVID-19. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ellen, for your presentation and for shedding light on the uh, importance of uh, looking at COVID uh, as not a gender neutral uh, pandemic. Uh, thank you for uh, for showing us how this pandemic has impacted women, because in Uganda, women are the caregiver, ga caregivers that are responsible of providing water. Uh, and therefore, uh, because uh, due to the uh, washing and the increase of use of water, they have been more, uh, more uh, women and girls more, uh, they have spent more time on water collection. Therefore, they were uh, really at risk of, uh, of contacting COVID-19. But more importantly, it's really important to look at uh, how Caritas Uganda uh, looked at uh, at how they can help women, especially when they uh, when they saw that women are not represented represented in uh, in uh, at district level in committees. So I guess you highlighted an important aspect, which is women representation, given the place for women to voice out their concerns, but as well as uh, empowering them in order to implement many projects and the importance of gender analysis in our projects. Uh, thank you again, Helen, for this important points raised. And uh, I can see in the chat that uh, there have been questions asked by Alessandra and immediately answered by, uh, by Maria. Uh, therefore, we will move to our fourth panelist. Uh, Christina Pancho from Caritas Ecuador. Christina uh, will be uh, presenting and uh, will be showcasing how women are mobilizing women at grassroots level in fighting against COVID-19. Uh, Christina will be presenting in Spanish. Christina, the floor is yours. Hola, buenos días desde Latinoamérica y buenas tardes 
a todos los demás. Eh, mi nombre es Cristina Pancho y trabajo para Caritas. Yo les voy a hablar sobre todo eh, las mujeres Caritas y cómo estas mujeres Caritas han estado en primera línea también eh, en la lucha y dando respuesta a lo que fue la pandemia del COVID-19. Eh, también les voy a hablar eh, desde la... No sé si se mira mi, el cambio de mi pantalla. Okay. Eh, yo voy a hablar sobre todo desde eh, lo que ha sido nuestra intervención en movilidad humana. Nosotros, eh, como Caritas de Ecuador, eh, más de 10 años venimos acompañando lo que son migraciones forzadas, especialmente lo que ha sido población colombiana por el conflicto armado, eh, población haitiana y actualmente lo que es la migración venezolana. Entonces, desde esas realidades y desde todo lo que ha implicado estas migraciones forzadas, Caritas ha venido interviniendo en diferentes líneas a través de intervención humanitaria, a través de ejes de protección, a través de inserción socioeconómica. Sin embargo, la, eh, las familias migrantes y refugiadas que llegan a Ecuador, muchas de ellas llegan en situaciones de precarización, en condiciones de extrema vulnerabilidad, y eso ya lo vivían antes de la pandemia. ¿Qué sucede con la pandemia? Que estas situaciones se agudizan aún más y muchos de ellos empiezan a buscar estrategias de cómo sobrevivir. En Ecuador, la mayor parte de la población vive del trabajo informal. Significa de las ventas en la calle, de venta de productos, venta ambulante, como la denominamos acá. Con el confinamiento en Ecuador, que arranca el 16 de marzo, y donde el gobierno ecuatoriano plantea que todos los habitantes debemos entrar a, a confinamiento total, esto significa que todas estas intervenciones de tratar de inserción económica, ventas ambulantes, quedan paralizadas. Ya las familias antes no tenían eh, los ingresos necesarios para su subsistencia, mucho menos tenían ahorros o propuestas de cómo afrontar lo que iba a ser el cocinamiento. En ese, en ese contexto, Caritas comienza su respuesta humanitaria. Hay que, hay que plantear que eh, de nuestro equipo de movilidad humana, el 83% somos mujeres. Significa que tenemos una alta presencia como trabajadoras Caritas en, en respuesta humanitaria y en este caso en respuesta a la movilidad humana. Eh, nosotros como Caritas arrancamos nuestra, nuestra intervención cinco días después de lo que fue eh, el confinamiento en Ecuador. Esto implicó que, mu que volvamos a entender cómo, cómo intervenir en estos momentos. La ayuda humanitaria se desborda, empe empezamos a tener mucha demanda de varias ciudades de del Ecuador en busca sobre todo de lo que era alimentación, higiene y alojamiento. Entonces, Caritas, después de cinco días, todavía sin entender bien cómo es los contagios, eh, cómo va a funcionar todo esto de, de la pandemia, vuelve a salir y vuelve al encuentro. Ahí tenemos mujeres multidisciplinarias que aprendieron que si yo era abogada y antes mi trabajo era en asesoría jurídica a las familias migrantes de cómo regularizar su situación, si yo era psicóloga y antes mi trabajo estaba enfocado en, el, en la intervención, en crisis, de cómo dar terapia en temas de depresión, pues ahora tengo que sumar los hombros y empezar a trabajar a nivel multidisciplinario. ¿Qué significa? Todos a la intervención de emergencia. Todos apoyarnos como equipo, con todas, más bien todas, apoyarnos como equipo y salir al trabajo humanitario. Ahí podrán ver algunas fotos de todo el trabajo que hicieron nuestras compañeras mujeres caritas en diferentes lugares del país, desde lugares remotos, desde zonas rurales, donde el acceso es muy difícil, hasta en las ciudades urbanas, atendiendo en la respuesta humanitaria. Esto significó mucho también para la población migrante y además de la población migrante, también la ecuatoriana, que también recibimos mucha solicitud de ayuda, que era en el tema de cómo logramos sobrevivir, pero también a nivel emocional. 
En ese sentido, también eh, entender que las familias, al estar en, país, en un país como Ecuador, que todavía no había las garantías de salud, que todavía no se conocía cómo, cómo se iba a abordar o gestionar la pandemia, también empezaron los, los miedos a futuro. ¿Qué va a pasar con nosotros como migrantes? ¿Qué va a pasar con nuestras familias? En ese sentido, las mujeres caritas estuvieron ahí en primera línea ah, desde el principio de la pandemia, eh, atendiendo y acompañando a las familias. Esto también significó muchos desafíos para nosotros porque eh, tuvimos que dejar de lado nuestros miedos. Eh, las mujeres caritas tú, también son madres, también tenían hijos y a raíz de la pandemia las escuelas en Ecuador cierran y todo se vuelve virtual. ¿Esto qué significó? Que haya una doble carga en las trabajadoras de Cáritas. Por un lado, respondiendo y atendiendo a la emergencia a tanta familia migrante, pero otro lado también con su carga familiar, con su carga de atender a sus hijos, con su carga de ahora educar desde casa a todos ellos que se quedaban también en nuestras familias. Entonces, con todo esto, con todo esta, este contexto, eh, las mujeres estuvieron ahí. También decirlo que eh, el miedo al contagio fue muy latente durante todos estos meses. Las primeras semanas fueron las más duras para todos nosotras. Y eh, también contarles que tuvieron que afrontar lo que era familias. Muchas de ellas también se contagiaron de COVID. Y sin embargo, después de que pasaron el COVID, volvieron a salir. Volvieron a estar con la gente y volvieron a seguir dando su respuesta humanitaria. Esto nos permite seguir, seguir fortaleciendo lo que fue nuestro camino de encuentro y nuestro camino de lucha. Muchas familias migrantes, contarles que en, esta, en la pandemia, por ejemplo, migrantes venezolanos de, de estaban decidiendo retornar nuevamente a sus países. Entonces nos encontrábamos con flujos, tanto que retornaban o querían retornar aun cuando las fronteras estaban cerradas y bueno, la otra gente que estaba buscando, o todas las familias que estaban buscando apoyo humanitario. Ahí también contar la estrategia que fue muy importante, esa empatía de mujer a mujer. Por un lado, la mujer trabajadora Caritas, pero por otro lado también la mujer migrante, que también buscaba en esta línea estrategias de sobrevivencia. Cómo mantener a sus hijos, cómo resguardar un techo, porque ya después de dos, tres meses empezaron los problemas de desalojo por no pagar los alquileres de las casas. Entonces, desde estas realidades también conjugadas de mujeres, también se generaban empatías y entendían, y también fue todo una carga emocional para las mujeres trabajadoras de Cáritas, de asumir toda esta, o de absorber todo este eh, sentido, ¿no? Por un lado su familia, pero por otro lado también todo lo que implicaba en la emoción o los desbordes emocionales de las mujeres migrantes que también buscaban medios para subsistencia. También contar aquí eh, un tema muy importante que Caritas trabajó y que está dando mucho realce es el tema de la violencia basada en género. Con la pandemia y el confinamiento, Ecuador tuvo unos índices altos de violencia intrafamiliar. Esto también involucraba tanto a mujeres migrantes como a mujeres ecuatorianas. Esto aún más realzaba los sentidos de vulneración ante las mujeres. Desde ahí también Caritas y a través de sus equipos ha buscado generar espacios de información, de da, dar seguimiento en casos donde se han identificado violencia contra la mujer intrafamiliar. Entonces, la pandemia, a más de eh, significar una respuesta humanitaria, una respuesta de primera línea, también ha significado o más bien ha resaltado ya otros males que teníamos como sociedad en cuanto a la violencia. Y ahí también resaltar mucho otra vez el trabajo que han hecho nuestras compañeras en terreno porque han sabido también conjugar estos dos niveles. O sea, han sabido por un lado informar y otro lado, por otro lado también acompañar estas situaciones o estos casos de violencia intrafamiliar. Y eh, para finalizar, desde los puestos de liderazgo, que era la última pregunta que también nos habían compartido, ¿cómo Caritas ve el liderazgo de las mujeres? Eh, yo partiría igual desde la organización primero. Caritas tiene un rostro femenino, 
Y en esto lo hemos podido ver desde la pandemia, la sonrisa y esa mirada, esa mirada también de alegría y de esperanza la hemos podido transmitir mediante nuestras mujeres trabajadoras de Cáritas. Creo que es importante seguir valorando el trabajo que hacen las mujeres dentro de nuestra organización, dentro de esta primera línea. Muchas de ellas se han preparado y han podido dar una respuesta inmediata en contextos de emergencia. Y esto es una, al menos en nuestra Caritas Ecuador, ha significado una muestra de lo que eh, la preparación que tenemos como mujeres, del trabajo que se ha podido hacer en terreno con ellas y que no importa los lugares, siempre han estado a la predisposición. Y yo creo que ese trabajo, esa experiencia conjugada en terreno, les, también les brinda habilidades y les brinda todo ese conocimiento para poder generar incidencia, para también estar en puestos de liderazgo, de gestión, que eh, vemos cada vez mujeres más preparadas y mujeres que siguen afrontando y siguen conjugando su vida como personas, en su vida personal, como madres, como hermanas, como hijas, pero también su vida desde su lado profesional. Un lado que ha sido muy valorado también acá eh, eh, con la población migrante, de ese lado humano, de ese lado que a pesar de la pandemia estuvo para poder escucharlos, estuvo para poder atenderlos. Obviamente, eh, como lo decía, eh, la pandemia nos, de, nos desbordó, no podemos atender a tanta necesidad que hay, pero sí hemos tratado justamente de dar un acompañamiento como esa iglesia, esa iglesia que sale, esa iglesia que va al encuentro. Y eso es lo que podemos compartir desde Ecuador, desde el trabajo que ha sido como nosotros como mujeres, desde esa empatía también con las mujeres migrantes que siguen luchando, que siguen buscando cómo sobrevivir ellas y también cómo generar ingresos para sus familias en un contexto latinoamericano con crisis económica, con crisis sanitaria, que todavía hay mucho por trabajar pero que la resiliencia y la empatía entre trabajadoras y grupos de atención eh, se ha podido conjugar. Eso compartirles desde Ecuador. Thank you, Cristina. Uh, thank you for, uh, for stressing the uh, importance of women as onlineers. And I guess a uh, very recurring topic throughout all the, 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 the interventions or the presentation is the fact that not only women are the first responders, but as well as they are a force of change. So they are there. They, it, it is important to stress uh, the work done by women because they are always prepared, always ready, and they are leaders. And uh, if, uh, if uh, I can build on Alessandra's questions in the chat box and uh, address it to, to our panelists and ask them, how can exactly women be a force of change? Uh, Maria, uh, uh, Helen, uh, Hanan, anyone would like to answer? Maria? Sure. <laughs> um, I, I just, uh, you know, try to, to give the floor also to our uh, lovely colleagues from all over the world, as I really, really feel very honored to, to be among them. Well, uh, we, we have seen in this particular situation in COVID, but also in financial crisis, in uh, displacement situations, how women, you know, being so, let's just say, in the core of the idea of preservation of life, uh, perceive, let's just say, in matter, in uh, situations of change, if, uh, of uh, urgency, a different approach. Uh, they get uh, awakened. They, they become the, the leading uh, force of their families. We have seen uh, women doing amazing things all this time during the refugee crisis, the financial crisis. Uh, in Greece, we had also this, uh, currently, this uh, big movement of uh, uh, our own Me Too campaign against sexual exploitation, again, started uh, by a woman who was a, an Olympian, a, a woman who won the Olympic medal of um, sailing in, uh, in the sports uh, and also in arts. Uh, so I think that uh, we see, let's just see somehow, 
um, a resilience from women in these difficult times and difficult situations. It's not, uh, I think, uh, uh, very a novelty. I think uh, everywhere in, in the Second World War and uh, in all kinds of crises, we see women, uh, when the situation gets really tough, you know, taking a leading role in the, this preservation for the future, for striving for a better society. And I think nowadays we do have also the means uh, through the social media, other kinds of uh, situations where women also, we have seen in political situations, also women taking the lead. Um, and I'd say that in Caritas Elas, we, we put our, our deals, our mouth, uh, our actions where our mouth is. We, most of our uh, senior staff is women. So Maria is here to, our, our director, Maria Alberti is here to, to attest to that. So I think uh, it's a matter of, um, you know, really women taking uh, this natural force that they have and really making it a force of change. Thank you, Maria, and uh, thank you as well for Cristina from Caritas Ecuador. Your uh, your intervention was really interesting. Interesting. And uh, now off to our final panelist uh, from Caritas Philippines. In the past year, aside from the COVID pandemic, two major disasters occurred in the countries: the typhoon and the volcano eruptions, which affected Philippine economy and Philippine uh, normal life. Uh, we have with us um, uh, Jingi Henderson, research and advocacy head. Uh, we were supposed to be joined by Jenny Curiano, uh, but I guess with the lockdown, Jenny could not access uh, the internet. So we're really uh, happy to have uh, Jingi, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Rita, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. On behalf of our humanitarian lead, Ms. Jeannie Coriano, I'll be presenting to you the experiences of women at Caritas Philippines during our responses to this last couple of life-altering months because of COVID-19. Uh, Philippines, as you have known, with a population of more than uh, 100 million, experiences an average of 20 to 24 typhoons a year. During the last quarter of last year, six moderate to strong typhoons hit mainland Luzon, affecting more than 3 million Filipinos, mostly women and children. We are also losing 170 billion pesos a year due to disasters, an amount which uh, could have been used to construct at least 600,000 houses. Other hazards are also present like earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, armed conflict, and just recently the red tagging from government forces. Um, on March 15, 2020, uh, 2020, the whole country was placed under the enhanced community quarantine due to COVID-19 pandemic. At uh, present, while initial rollout of the vaccines are being done, cases still continue to escalate and we are now second in Southeast Asia. According to the March 2021 report of Human Rights Watch, the government's response to COVID-19 also has resulted in serious human rights violations. And then to this, we have 17.7% of unemployment rate and 30.7% hunger rate with whom women and children experiencing the heaviest of burdens. But as we very well known, our church, uh, we cannot be daunted. So on April 2020, Caritas Philippines adopted the idea of setting up the Caritas Kindness Stations, which started actually in my diocese. I was one of the founders of the Kindness Station, together with a number of friends, mostly women, who believed that the only way to counter the effects of COVID was to counter greed with kindness, generosity, and compassion. So with the same concept, Caritas Philippines trailblazed the idea further by incorporating our humanitarian frameworks at Caritas, which are localization, accountability, community solidarity, and safeguarding and protection. The Caritas Kindness Stations are run mainly by parish or community volunteers or the members of our self-help uh, savings mobilization groups, which are comprised, again, mostly of women. It works, uh, the Caritas Kindness Station works like a community store where everyone is welcome to get whatever they need for the day. 
sharing something in return, um, be it vegetable from their gardens, a bottle of soy sauce, or a kilo of rice, making giving and sharing the in thing in the communities. So our community-led monitoring, accountability, evaluation, and learning teams are also predominantly led by and composed of women. Interestingly, they have been very instrumental in uh, increasing accountability and feedbacking within and among our partner communities where we have projects and responses. For example, the reports that we receive via the Caritas Philippines Facebook page are 90% coming from women, which tells us how engaged they are in community building, despite all the difficulties. At Caritas Philippines and the Diocesan Social Action Centers, women staff are a majority, as shown in the 57% women versus 43% men in enrollees at our Social Action Academy. By the way, we would like to say thank you also for um, everybody who's been supporting the Social Action Academy of Caritas Philippines. So at this rate, and with more than five decades of history and experience in humanitarian development and advocacy work in a developing country like the Philippines, our women workers, or as we call ourselves today, the frontliners, have significantly contributed in the following spheres. Family development. We are not just mothers, we also become teachers now that the education system has shifted to modular um, uh, education and a blended learning. We also are into organizational improvement, service delivery and program innovations, community building and empowerment, and advocacy actions. So uh, in the Philippines, you have to imagine this one. A, show, a social worker in the Philippines would serve for an average of 20 years in the diocese. So her responsibilities would range from the uh, following, but is never limited to this list. She needs to organize communities, respond to disasters and other emergencies, develop our youth uh, sector, monitor and support livelihood groups, set up basic sector groups like farmers, fishermen, women. Uh, they have to also train women in particular. Uh, they have to implement programs, uh, do resource mobilization, and partnership development. We can also include um, enforcing discipline among our priests if need be. So those are the range of, uh, of work that women in the Philippines would be doing, especially if they are into social action. So on an average, a Filipina social action worker with 20 years of experience has worked with more than 200 communities in a diocese. This is equivalent to an estimate of 20,000 families or 100,000 lives being influenced by a woman in her lifetime during her, her career as a social action worker in the Philippines. So look at how powerful we are. So as a Filipino woman or women, we believe that we are not just responders. We are shapers of institutions and game changers. And we are serving at the very heart of the Catholic Church, of the Church of the Poor in the Philippines a very fitting place as we celebrate the 500 years of Christianity in the country. Thank you and mabuhay. Thank you a lot for this uh, powerful and empowering presentation. Uh, it's really interesting to see the Caritas Condon stations, but it's really interesting as well to listen how women are juggling multi uh, multitasking, uh, especially when they are social workers or within the fields. And I guess what a better way to conclude uh, the, uh, the interventions by saying, look at how powerful we are as women. Uh, thank you a lot. Uh, it's really an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I will uh, give the floor to Helen. Uh, she will be adding as well to the previously asked questions and giving her own uh, as well answer for, uh, for the question as how women can be a force of change. Uh, Helen? Uh, thank you so much, Rita. Um, I was adding to the voice of Maria in her response that considering the di distinct role and responsibility of a woman, 
Uh, when she is faced uh, with a disaster, she will plan. Uh, she gives details to the plans. They are small, small details she, that she puts in, but these details, at a long time, you realize they answer to the immediate needs, immediate and the urgent needs of the society as a whole. It could be small uh, relating to her family or her community, but in the long run, you realize that these small details are the ones that were the major concern for the whole society. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, we received one question from Olga Haddad in the chat box. Uh, Olga is asking, and I would ask the panelists to answer this question. Do you think that we have always two separate actions done by men or women? When will we be able to be more free and talk about human actions in Caritas without specifying men or women? Any of the panelists would like to answer Olga's questions. Um, I'll take the first shot. Uh, I think if it is, if it is uh, specific to Caritas, we should realize that uh, we still need uh, planning, not specifically alone as women, but we need to focus also of, on uh, um, escalating or improving uh, the, women, the woman's voice or the woman's approach into so many things. Uh, with Caritas, uh, when you look at, at, at our structure, you realize that we are still at a, at a, at a a very uh, a low gap to reach. However much that uh, some characters says you'll find that there's so women are taking the lead. But when you look at the ultimate governance body of uh, characters uh, as, a, as a, an, an organization under the Catholic Church, the governance body is still um, dominated by male. You know, at times even you fear to bring it, but you can see it is really dominated by male. So that calls upon us to work as hard as we can to make sure that these issues of women are reaching up to our governance body at the top. Uh, when it comes to, to, to the general, general, the secular, not only, it is, it, you can also still uh, realize that the women are still lagging behind. For example, when it comes to the COVID responses, you will realize the impact was most on women, especially in Uganda. 71% of our women are in the informal sector. So when they say lockdown, that means no employment, no income, uh, so many, so much compared to the man, to the men. Statistics are even showing that women who are going hungry were more than men who are going hungry. So there is need to discuss and bring, our, and bring us all to par. Then from there, we can start journeying together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, Maria? Yes, I'd also like to make uh, a point here because, uh, I mean, it's a little bit like this dilemma with the Black Lives Matters and then all lives matter, of course, all lives matter. But why do we focus sometimes on some specific groups? Why? Because there have been, let's just say, the groups where they have been underrepresented or been excluded for some uh, reason. Uh, we always think that women nowadays, especially in the, you know, Western modern societies are empowered and we can do whatever we like, but still we see differences in pays, uh, in wages uh, for people between different uh, jobs, doing the same job, getting different payments. Uh, there are still um, misrepresentations in many fields. So it will be a glorious day when, Olga, we can say that we will no longer focus on women <laughs> and we all look forward to that day. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Uh, Jinke? Yes, thank you so much, Rita. Um, just in response to the earlier question, so uh, first, before August question, I just like to say that um, women uses her mind, um, heart, and soul in everything that we do. Uh, I'm not saying that men are not using this, but in as much as we have to, uh, like, um, uh, accept the fact that women first uses her heart, heart to draw um, compassion and resilience and next her soul to give concrete solidarity and bring about the common good and her mind. 
to really strategize. Look at how we do things, manage things at home. We strategize and then we innovate. And that goes to the next question, why we have to um, differentiate discussions about from men and women. Um, it's just like uh, the church giving preferential option to the poor. We have to, at some point, think about how, at this point, we need to really um, champion the causes of women and children. And maybe, yes, um, in the next lifetime, we will not be having this discussion anymore because um, we have already, as women, asserted our rights and our place in the world. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Uh, actually, um, I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, your presentation today was really uh, interesting, empowering, uh, giving us and shedding lights on many and many questions. And uh, it is a continuous of uh, the, the first webinar. I guess it's uh, important how uh, Carita Syria shed the light on the importance of education, especially for women. It's important that all the panelists agree that women are the first responders to COVID. It's, it's really important that all panelists agree that uh, women are the force of change. So it's important to give them education as Carita Syria um, uh, just gave in the presentation. Uh, Caritas Gris has um, uh, really uh, highlighted the fact of the new vulnerability, but as well as uh, again, women as force of change, Caritas Uganda, on the importance of, uh, of involving women at all levels of decision making, on the importance of having gender analysis. And I guess this will answer as well Olga's questions because with gender analysis, different uh, responses uh, will emerge and the importance as well of advocacy. Uh, Ecuador uh, and Philippines both uh, reiterate the importance of women as force of change and shapers of institutions. Thank you for our panelists. I guess there's um, many lessons learned and many steps to be undertaken by our confederation for the next future years as well to empower women. And um, I uh, thank everyone who attended and I will leave the floor to Moira. Moira, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rita. Uh, I think that uh, the presentation and the testimonies that uh, we had uh, today were very interesting to witness uh, what women on the front line can do, what is really the uh, what are the strengths uh, of women? Uh, the, we talk about uh, empathy, we talk about uh, the heart and at the same time, the professionalism of, uh, of women. And this is a bit a fil rouge of, uh, uh, of these webinars between the first one and the second, uh, and this second webinar. And this one will conduct us uh, to the third one that will take place uh, next week uh, on Monday, Monday afternoon afternoon from uh, time and the 22nd. If uh, I should find some uh, key words uh, to highlight for these two webinars, I would identify engagement, leadership, but also vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, I like to uh, highlight and to underline uh, what was uh, said uh, uh, today women are on the front line and when on the, on, the, on the front line, they work in team, the added value of the teamwork. Uh, and the teamwork, not only among women, but the teamwork uh, together, women and men, to listen to the people, to meet the people, despite the challenges, despite the difficulties. Christina from Ecuador highlighted this very strongly. And I think that uh, this is, one of the added value of uh, what, uh, how women can uh, contribute. Another point that uh, I like to uh, put in evidence is the fact that uh, despite the time of crisis we are living uh, due to the COVID-19, uh, we are trying to find opportunities in this time of crisis. And this is something that brings us to look at the future in a realistic way, but also in an optimistic way, what we can do more and how we can do more. After the women on the front line, next Monday, we will reflect together uh, on women, women in leadership position. We will have uh, some different experiences from the different regions of our confederation and leadership at all levels, not only 
at global level, but also at grassroots level. Another important moment of sharing, and I hope to see you again all uh, in this meeting and more than today. On this word, I would like to thank all of you and give the floor for a word of conclusion and for the final prayer to Cardinal Maffi. I'm really honored that you are with us today too. Uh, and this is really a pleasure and a honor for us. Your eminence, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rita. It's quite uh, inspiring to myself too, just listening and especially how you rounded up nicely all the uh, contributions from the speakers. So let us pray. I just like to pray the uh, memorare prayer of Blessed Mother. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, and never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother, to thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. May God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much, Your Eminence. Thank you for your presence. Thank you all. See you on Monday. And a special thanks to Rita, who moderates the webinar today. Thank you very much, Rita. <laughs>